as an architect, you have an amazing opportunity to change people's lives. That is one of the great side effects of this job. We can truly make a difference. The flip side of that is a pretty big responsibility because whatever we do is around for quite a long time. And then the next complication in this is that we actually can't really make any decisions. We can only be the advocates and try to get you, the clients, to do something. We don't decide anything. At the end of the day, it is the client. So today, I'm going to try to possibly convince you that there is a problem that you should be aware of. I think it's fascinating to realize that we share 96% of our DNA with him. And if you then look at the things that he enjoys, I go, well, I can enjoy, I like that too. A hot tub, cold weather, hot tub is perfect for me. He seems to like it, I like it. So that makes sense. If you then think of him entering a lot of our buildings, you start to think, well, maybe he would find some of our buildings really uncomfortable and not such a pleasure. If you then look at food, when I was a kid, this was heaven. I would have loved to have this kind of food all day long, and quietly, I probably did a bit too much of it. Nowadays, there's good food, there's bad food, there's junk food, and there's healthy food. Jamie Oliver and a lot of other heroes have taught us to understand that there's good and there's bad. At the moment, though, we human beings seem to have pretty bad understandings of what is actually a good environment, what's a good internal environment for us, and what's a bad environment for us. If you ask children, show them lots of images of landscapes, children from all over the world, under the age of 10, pick the savanna. Again, you say, well, that's kind of the continuation of the monkey story, but it proves there are some things that human beings like and that are good for them, I would argue, that probably stimulates their senses in an adequate way. And then there are other things which are not as good. The CIA carried out studies to study uh, central deprivation. They took a beautiful white room, they air-conditioned it perfectly, they had the perfect light levels in it, they put people in it with gloves, and they realized that students, after 24 hours, were starting to show first signs of hallucination, and after 48 hours, they basically broke down and collapsed. Sensory deprivation is as bad for your brain as the lack of stimulation is to your muscles. You all know the phenomenon of having a plaster cast, and then your muscles have, you know, suffer from atrophy and basically disappear. The same, in very simplistic terms, happens to your brain. If you do not stimulate it, it will actually change plasticity and shrink. In order to fight that, your brain creates hallucination. If you would be still living in the countryside, if you'd be working the farm, like this gentleman over here, this whole talk would be irrelevant. But as you all know, it's more than 50% of the world now lives in cities. And the most terrible thing about that is that they spend, like the US citizen, 87% of their time indoors. Even that wouldn't be the worst problem of all problems, but the problem is actually artificial environments. In the last century, starting in the 30s, had a big peak around the Second World War. The black box factory was invented. You create a big box, you don't need any windows, I'll give you artificial light, and then you pump in air conditioning to keep everyone alive and let them produce aeroplanes, machines. You can do whatever you like in these buildings. They're super cheap and they're extremely flexible. You can even stack them on top of each other and create an office building. You can have multiple levels of these factory floors. As long as you keep them nice and sealed, don't let anything in or out, and you just pump in your air conditioning. The truth is that these buildings create the blandest environments possible. They basically are just the equivalent of the white room I showed you just a few minutes before. You can actually argue that these buildings are no other things than submarines, completely sealed, artificial environments, and the military studied submarines because we had, they had a problem with crews suffering from hallucination because they obviously had sensory deprivation. 
Crew members, uh, when they come to shore, had high levels of accident because their eyesight was disappearing because they had, you were not using the long distance vision. Coming back to uh, the submarine and office buildings, a lot of towers you look at are actually built like submarines. They're completely sealed, and even though a guy or a woman would be just this close to the glass, and on the other side of the glass is lovely fresh air of a day like this, they can't get it. The air comes in from the top of the building or somewhere at the bottom of the building, is sucked into a plant room, the fresh air then is mixed with used air that everyone has been using all day, and then it's pumped all the way through, through long ducts, until it finally gets to you. A, these ducts are clean or not clean, but B, this whole system is extremely energy intensive. Buildings use up about 40% of the world's energy. So these machines are actually a huge part of global warming and damaging to the environment. So you just imagine you don't need the machine, you switch off the machine, every minute you switch it off, you're actually saving energy. So my argument is you're creating something that is pretty bad in the first place, and it is high energy, so why are we doing it? The next topic is that this energy, th these environments are set by one man or one woman who's the facility manager and everyone gets the same stuff. And looking at all of you now, I mean, it's interesting, yes, I've flown in, we all have different lives before we enter this uh, conference today. You're all different. Your physiology, your psychology is all different. So assuming that anyone can decide what you want to have all day is bizarre. You would never accept that someone decides what you're gonna eat all day or all week or all year, and particularly having the same all year round would be the right answer. You'd say, that can't be. I think the Garden of Eden is not a bad starting point. It looks like good company. It looks like a, a diverse, uh, diverse group of friends. I can almost feel the sun. I can feel the dappled light, the breeze, the smell. On a more serious note, this is called anesthesia. Scientists have found out that what you want is the stimulation of your senses, and you want that stimulation to vary and to oscillate throughout the day. If you have, even if you have the perfect stimulation, you want to vary from it. The same thing all day long is bad for you. Then there's a very interesting man called Alexander Gottlieb Baumgarten. He wrote an important book called Aesthetica. He actually invented the word aesthetica, aesthetics. And he wanted aesthetics to be one of the serious sciences. It was the science of the senses, the science of sensory cognition. And his point was that sight, sound, hearing, smelling, all our senses is just as important, and you should take care of them and actually use them to judge the world around you. You go for a walk in the forest, and I think every one of you knows what you feel like after you've been through a walk in the forest. You feel how the light changes, the air changes. I mean, that is the environment I'm talking about. And if you know, if you spend a few hours in the blue box, you might have a headache. I mean, for example, air conditioning is one of the biggest contributors to people's headaches in the office environment. Yeah? I think if you just listen to your own experience and your own senses, I think you all know what I'm talking about. You look at daylight. There is not one hour where the light has the same color as the next. It's blue at lunchtime, and it's yellow, golden in the evening. So if you think, and in the evening, for example, that type of light makes your body produce melatonin. Melatonin helps you sleep. At the end of the day, though, if you spend your time in an office where you keep blue light, you come home and you can't sleep. But that is because you've been spending all day in a blue-lit office building. Coming uh, with a different type of blue, I want to now talk about three projects. So starting with a healthcare project, this is a very humble project for Maggie's in Manchester. Maggie's uh, build uh, center f centers for uh, cancer care. We were trying to do a very gentle building, you just saw the greenhouse at the end, and we actually went back to basics and thought, well, what do you think someone would like to do? And as we believe in, should be inside and outside, and of course it's naturally ventilated, and it should feel very natural and earthy, 
or we like the idea of, of sitting, on a, sitting on a veranda. Even in Manchester, you see, we rendered it was rain. That's beautiful too. Enjoy the rain, hear the rain, smell the trees, smell the different seasons, the grass. That is actually what we think life is about. On a completely different scale, we're working with the European Space Agency thinking of habitats on the moon. We realize the whole natural story doesn't quite work. Natural ventilation on the moon doesn't quite work. So here there's a fascination that I want to show you. We work with a lot of scientists, and a lot of science has actually come into our work over the last few years, probably over, dec over the last few decades by now. We work with the people who were in the... Uh, in the International Space Station. They told us, which was fascinating, that the things they missed the most after family and friends was the smell of fresh air. The space station had a window designed for it. The window was supposed to be a large window, and it was designed in the 80s. That window was designed, it was built as a prototype, and then they did budget cuts, they didn't take it, they decided to move on, take other pieces. And finally, in 2010, the window came and it was an amazing copula, which allowed the people's view down. The reason I'm telling you this is there are things which mission control engineers say, this is not critical for this mission. There is no scientific need for a window. But I actually think it's a question of humanity. And I think it is actually important to fight for things which you realize they're actually for us, they're for human beings. So I'm just putting this one as a monument to people's endurance and fighting for something that is right. We're doing uh, another mission uh, for Mars, 3D printing habitats on Mars. We send swarms of little robots up ahead of the astronauts where we believe people will not want to live in 2001 uh, space odyssey environments. They will not want to be surrounded by white plastic. They will probably like texture and real materials, which is actually comes out of research working with the Haley team, the uh, South Pole Station. Back to understanding uh, human beings. That is actually a huge part of our research. We've evolved from an architectural practice into something very unusual. We have we have a lot of scientists, we have psychologists, we have artists, we have people who do special renderings and special simulations of airflow. This is the scientist, Carlos, who developed this contraption and it is used for emotional mapping. And you can basically wear it, walk around and track with a film and also the intensity of your experience, how he felt. You can see he started in our office uh, where he was probably a bit bored. Then his uh, excitement level went up as he went along the Thames, and he must have met someone exciting at the corner of the King's Road, uh, <laughs> but he is not telling us who it was. <laughs> we're also, uh, but we're taking it very serious. We're building software, and yeah, we're having special building physics specialists, scientists, who try to find how can I simulate what people will feel like. Can I simulate it with software? Do I actually build physical models? This is a chamber which then is filled with smoke and the smoke rises around the heat of your own body. All of this became the basis for the campus project in Cupertino, which is a very close collaboration with Steve Jobs, who's no longer with us, and Johnny Ive. And we basically try to go right back to basics and find out what do human beings really want? What is the perfect environment that would encourage creativity and nurture innovation? And we broke down the barriers completely. We created the longest sheets of glass in the world, but still kept natural ventilation, which you can see is air moving over the top. You can see the air going through this gap into the spaces so people can smell the outside and break down the barriers of inside and outside. People work in the park, they run in the park, the building and the park become one. And now just one tiny little thing which I thought would be fun for you, and that is the uh, big Apple flagship on Union Square, and this is totally about breaking down barrier. You imagine we were just outside looking at the patio, it would be as if this entire wall opens up. It is 12 by 12 meters high, and it would be, we could just let the evening breeze come into this space and have this lecture semi-inside and outside. And that is basically what I'm talking about. And lambing back to my best friend, uh, on a serious note, I think I have for you that 
I wish you would go uh, home, you would go back to your offices, to the places you work on Monday, and just pause for a moment and go, what does this actually feel like? Does this place actually stimulate my senses? Or do you go, well, it doesn't. It's monotonous, bland, I have no control. And I actually think you deserve better. And I think you all deserve spaces that actually fulfill Baumgarten's definition. You know, you should have aesthetically pleasing spaces that give delight to all your senses. So break down the barriers because you have the right and you should have better spaces. Thank you very much.